Good morning. Welcome to Bayside. Glad you're here this morning. Good to be together to worship and to see all of you here today. I was a little worried, you know, being Labor Day weekend. Many times people are off uh, out uh, and about for this holiday weekend. And about 15 minutes before the service, it was Matt and my son, and they were throwing paper airplanes around in here. <laughs> so then I got really worried. <laughs> So I'm glad you all showed up because I still would have preached. I mean, they would have needed to hear it, but um, <laughs> thanks for being here today. This last summer, my family, I mentioned this last week, my family took a vacation. We, we drove out to Colorado. We did a wedding out there. And on the way to Colorado, we went to um, some of the big highlights, Mount Rushmore, of course, uh, through South Dakota there. And we stopped at a few other places you may have been before, Minnesota's largest candy store, I highly recommend it, especially if you like candy. My wife is like an addict, so uh, we had to stop there. Um, and, and as you're driving out that way, you, you might be familiar with this when you're driving in the middle of, you know, southern Minnesota and in South Dakota. And I'm not making any commentary on these areas. I'm just saying when you're driving, there's not a lot there, right? You're just driving and it's kind of empty space. And there might be a gas station every 30 miles or more. And you're just driving a long ways. And so it's kind of a welcome sight when you see some attraction. Uh, like uh, we stopped the, uh, a car museum and there, you know, wall drug is there and some of these other things you may have heard of. But then we saw the sign for the world's only corn palace. <laughs> some of you have been there. Have you been to the corn palace? Okay. Some of you have. So you know what I'm talking about. And I mean, every 10 miles, there was another sign telling us about this great corn palace. And I'll just preempt the story by saying I've been there before when I was in college. And I remembered. It was pretty cool. Um, but, you know, you're taking your whole family or whatever. So we were like, we're going to stop. And we're telling the kids, we're going to go to the world's only corn palace. And it's got to be this grand, amazing palace made of corn, full of corn, <laughs> And all sorts of awesome things inside. And so we pull off the highway, and there was a detour, and it took us like 10 or 15 minutes just to get back to, and they made you go around this backwards way, and so I was already starting to get annoyed. There really wasn't a place to park, and there were kind of some signs, but I wasn't sure if we were parking legally or if we were in the correct lot. And so we get out, and we walk up, and it is this, this big building, and on the side of the building, there's corn murals, and they're made of corn, and it's corn, and so it makes you feel like it's all made of corn. And then we walked in, and it was a high school gymnasium with a gift shop. <laughs> and so I'm not knocking, like, if you love the Corn Palace, or if you're from Mitchell, South Dakota, go you. Uh, but, like, when you hear about it, and you're like, it's the world's only Corn Palace, I started to feel like somebody came up with an idea, and they're like, we might be able to make some money. And then I read later, 500,000 people a year attend this place. But the funny thing is, it was free to get in. So I don't know what, what, how they're making the money and all that stuff, but when we went there, it just was uh, the kids really weren't all that impressed uh, with a, a high school gymnasium. We've been to one before. In fact, Superior's got a pretty good gym. Um, and there was a gift shop. It was literally, that was it. And of course, they probably had, like, they had concession stands. You could buy corn and other stuff. And there was a few other interesting things there. But it was kind of a disappointment, right? And I actually remembered when I went in college, and now this was different. I'm not with my, my family, my kids. It's college. Just imagine a bunch of 20, 21, and 22-year-olds running around a corn palace. I mean, we had a fun time. We were messing around and having a good old time. So I had this great memory of the corn palace. But when I went with my family, it was really disappointing. <laughs> <laughs> The only thing that wasn't disappointing is that we didn't have to pay any money. <laughs> so it was worth about as much as you pay to get in. You get what you pay for, right? But isn't that true in life? Sometimes there, there's things that are out there, and there's, there's, there's things that on the outside, they look appealing, and they look good. But on, and on the surface, they look great even. But on the inside, or underneath the surface, or once you get down to it, it's not really what you thought it was, right? Can you think of something in your life that was like that? Can you think of a place you've gone that was like that? Can you think of an event or an occurrence that was like that? You know, it's funny, first-time parents, 
when you first are getting excited about having a baby, and then when you have the baby, and you realize that all it does is eat, sleep, and poop, right? And so you have to change the diapers and feed it, and you never get to sleep because really they just cry all the time, right? So it's different, the expectations. And, and so it, it's life is like that, right? Have you ever met a person who on the outside they looked one way, but on the inside maybe not so much? Have you ever been that person? challenging thought this morning for us to consider. And I want to think about that as we look at the word today, as we look into God's word and trust that he's going to speak to us today. I'd ask you to open up in your Bible to Mark chapter 11. We're continuing walking through a few verses at a time in the book of Mark, the gospel of Jesus Christ according to Mark. We are in chapter 11. If you don't have a Bible, you can pull out the Pew Bible. It's on page 847. The last few weeks, we've been uh, looking at Jesus and his triumphant entry into Jerusalem, which we normally celebrate on Palm Sunday, but we did that a couple of weeks ago. And then, and then last week, we read about how he cursed the fig tree. And I want to get into that uh, this morning. I want to start there, actually, in verse 12, as we continue reading and looking at this story of Jesus and his disciples. So reading in verse 12 through 14 to start this morning. On the following day, when they came from Bethany, he, Jesus, was hungry. And seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And he said to it, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. So, a strange occurrence that we briefly talked about last week. Jesus curses a fig tree, and following this strange occurrence, Jesus goes from there, and we talked about this last week, and he cleanses the temple. And so we ask the question, what is the connection between these two stories? Why are these two stories sandwiched together? Why would Jesus curse a fig tree and then go immediately and cleanse out the temple? And like the cleansing of the temple, the story of the cursing of the fig tree has to do with judgment. I want to start this morning in looking as we consider the fig tree and kind of the rest of the story of the fig tree. I want to look at a tree. So we're going to pull up a picture of a a fig tree if we can. Uh, it, It doesn't look any different than some trees. It kind of looks more like a bush, I guess. But there's a fig tree and it's got all of its leaves there. It's kind of bloomed out. And you would say that that tree is leafed out. Uh, We can show another picture of a leaf. It's a pretty common leaf. It looks pretty normal like a a leaf on a tree. And if you go one more picture, you can see the fruit of a fig tree. And, and, And that's what a fig looks like. Very funny, ironic, this week, uh, well, first I'll say, I've never seen in all my life that you could buy figs at like Walmart or Super One or Sam's Club or wherever you go. I believe that you can. I'd never thought like, oh, that's like a rare thing you can ever get, but I'd never seen them. And this last week, I'm at Sam's Club. We're grabbing raspberries and blueberries, and there was a box of figs right there, and it just made me smile. I'm like, I almost bought it to bring it and like hand them out during the sermon, but no, I'm not going to do that. So, but there's, you can buy them. They're at Sam's Club right now, apparently. I'm sure you can get them anywhere else. Um, but there's a picture of a fig, the fruit of a fig tree. And so I want to talk about fig trees in Jerusalem. uh, And at that time, usually uh, a fig tree would leaf out in the spring, right, in March or in April. But they usually did not produce figs or the fruit until later in the season, more like once the summertime came in June. So the fig tree that Jesus cursed, it was in full leaf, but it had no figs to eat. Mark says that in verse 13. So the question I ask is, why would Jesus expect figs to be there if he knew it wasn't the time for figs to be there? Why did Jesus expect figs? Or did he? He knew that it wouldn't have figs on it. Jesus, we've proclaimed this throughout our series, Jesus was God. God is all-knowing. And so if he was God, and he is God, and he knows everything, why would he expect there to be figs? 
unless he knew and there was something deeper going on here. So then the question is, why curse this fig tree in what was the purpose? We briefly talked about this last week, but in the Old Testament, the fig tree was symbolized as Israel, the nation of God. God's chosen people were symbolized multiple times in the Old Testament as a fig tree. Hosea chapter 9, verse 10. Micah chapter 7, verses 1 through 4. Nahum chapter 3, verse 12. And Jeremiah chapter 8. All of these references and multiple other references in the Old Testament show Israel being compared to a fig tree. So here in this story, Jesus is cursing Israel, God's chosen people. Why would he do that? Jesus was giving the disciples a live-action parable. This fig tree being fully leafed out, but without fruit, was symbolic of the nation of Israel, their hypocrisy, and now their refusal to accept Jesus Christ as the Messiah. Jesus had spent the last three years teaching, preaching, healing, fulfilling prophecy, and yet they still didn't believe that he was the Messiah. And so he's making a point. As he's nearing the end of his life, he's beginning the last week of his life, and he curses the nation of Israel. Their hypocrisy and their refusal to accept him as the Messiah made their nation, the nation of Israel, ripe for judgment. Immediately after cursing the fig tree, this is what we went into last week, immediately Jesus enters the temple and begins to drive out the people who were there using it for a marketplace. He made this a teaching moment. He called out the Jewish people and he challenged their hearts. Last week we applied this to the church today and made a challenge for us individually to check our hearts. So I ask you to consider this morning your heart and the church. What is the state of the church today? What is the heart of the church today? And where is your heart today? So Jesus triumphantly enters Jerusalem, spends the night in Bethany, returns in the morning, cursing the fig tree on his way, and then cleanses the temple by driving out the marketplace that was happening. Quite a few hours for Jesus as he begins the last week of his life. So what happens next? Verse 19. We skip over to verse 19. It says, And when evening came, after he had cleaned out the temple, they went out of the city. They went out of the city, out of Jerusalem. For the second night in a row, Jesus and his disciples left Jerusalem for the night, probably again staying in Bethany, which we talked about. Jesus had purpose for everything that he did, and I believe the reason that they went out to Bethany at night was because he was in a dangerous position. It said in verse 18 that the chief priests and the scribes were looking for a way to destroy him. Spoiler alert. By the end of the week, they would destroy him. They would find their way. They would get their way. They would kill him at the end of this week. But not yet. The time was not yet. So Jesus and his disciples stayed outside. They stayed out of Jerusalem for that night. Let's read on now in verses 20 through 25 to look at what happened next. As they passed by in the morning... They saw the fig tree withered away to its roots. And Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. And Jesus answered them, Have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. And whenever you stand praying, forgive. If you have anything against anyone, 
so that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. <laughs> Did you see what happened there? Once again, Jesus flips the story upside down. Did you catch that? Did you see it? Jesus, in this midst of this moment, Peter comes to him. See, they see the fig tree withered. And I don't have a picture of a withered fig tree, but can you imagine that, that tree that was full of leaves yesterday, green and full and bloomed out? They walk by and it's completely withered. And Peter's amazed, surprised, shocked. Rabbi, look at it. It's withered. Can you believe it? And Jesus isn't astonished at all. He wasn't surprised. And right when Peter and, and likely the disciples think that they've just figured it all out, that this was about a fig tree, or maybe if they were smart enough, they knew it was about Israel. And so they think they've got it all figured out. And right when they think they've got it figured out, Jesus completely turns the story around. It's not about the fig tree anymore. It's not even about the nation of Israel anymore. It's about us. It's about you, Peter. It's about you, disciples. It's about you, believers. He flips it upside down and gives them the real lesson. He doesn't even answer about the fig tree. You see that? He says nothing about it. Jesus gives Peter and the disciples three ways to bear fruit. See, he knew that they knew about the cursing of the fig tree. I believe he knew that they knew that Israel was symbolized as a fig tree. I'm sure over the period of that night, he had talked to them about all of what happened, the cleansing of the temple. And so it's all about how Israel was not bearing fruit. And he gives them this lesson of how to bear fruit. Belief, faithful prayer, and forgiveness. First of all, belief. We can't bear fruit for God if we don't believe in him, in his son, Jesus Christ, and in his word. This is essential. It is the key part of who we are as Christians, as believers. If you don't believe, then what are you doing? This is the foundation of our faith, belief. We must believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and we must trust in him. It all starts with faith. Verse 23, he says, Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Do you think Peter and the disciples had that kind of faith? Do we have that kind of faith? That's a challenging thought for me to consider. Have I ever considered that I could say to a mountain, be thrown into the sea and believe that that could actually happen? Makes me wonder what my faith is really like and how strong my faith really is. He says, don't doubt, but believe. And we could go into a sermon series on faith. And I could go into another sermon series on bearing fruit. There's verses all throughout the New Testament about bearing fruit. But the first point that I want you to hear today is that Jesus is stressing the importance of belief. You must have faith. Secondly, to bear fruit, we must have faithful prayer. Look at the next verse, verse 24. He says, therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. Whatever we ask for in prayer, believe that we have received it. Faithful prayer, prayer for God's will, that is bearing fruit. It doesn't mean that we can pray for just anything that we want 
And all we have to do is believe and we'll get it. That's not how it works. But praying faithful prayers, prayers with belief that God is who he says he is and that God does what he says he will do and that God can do anything. Praying with faith in that and belief in that and praying for God's will. Now that is bearing fruit. Belief, faithful prayer. And thirdly, Jesus tells us and the disciples that bearing fruit requires forgiveness. Just when we thought it could be an easy, motivational message this morning, make us feel really good, and go home happy and not have to do anything hard, just believe and pray. It's easy. Jesus goes and teaches on forgiveness. Why would he do that? Why is forgiveness so important to God? Want to know why? Because of sin. Because we've messed up this world. Because we keep hurting one another and keep sinning against each other. And we've messed it all up. And the only way we can get past that is through forgiveness. Bearing fruit mean, means we are ambassadors for Christ. We carry and live out the heart of God. If you read the Bible enough, you will understand that the heart of God is reconciliation. Verse 25. And whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. Forgiveness. I challenge you today to consider it and, and, and forgiveness is something that goes two ways, as we know, but it goes two ways for us, too. Not just saying that it's between two people and they both have to participate in this. I'm saying that each one of us has to ask for forgiveness when we've messed up and seek forgiveness from those who've hurt us. So there's two different things going on with forgiveness. And I think that we struggle with both of those. When someone hurts me, I don't want to forgive them. I want to hold it against them. I want to hurt them. Right? And when I mess up, I don't want to admit that I messed up. I don't want to seek forgiveness from them. I want to ignore it. I want to sweep it under the rug. I want to forget about it and pretend it never happened. But that's not what God's heart is. God's heart beats for reconciliation. God's word, the theme, the, the story of the Bible is about forgiveness and reconciliation. God gave us this wonderful creation of earth and all that is in it. And God blessed us with free will to choose to do whatever we wanted to do. But sin entered this world. And now our human nature and our sinful nature causes a separation between us and between God and between us and between those that we sin against. And God is a just God. He is a God of justice. And what that means is that, that means that there is punishment for sin. We don't like that. We don't want to talk about that. That there's punishment for sin. But the good news of God's story, the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ is that God gave his son, Jesus, to take on that punishment for our sin. And because he died on the cross, we have the opportunity to be reconciled to God through faith in Jesus Christ. That is the gospel. This story, this parable you see as it unfolds is a live and active object lesson from Jesus. This is the gospel. And see, people who don't understand the word, 
don't understand that when you open up God's word, it all points back to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus used the fruitless fig tree to provide an object lesson for the disciples and for us. A warning, if you will. This is what he's saying to us. Don't be giving a fruitful impression only to fail in backing it up. Don't be all leaves and no fruit, all expectation and no satisfaction. Don't be the corn palace, people. <laughs> I'm sorry if you really like the corn palace. <laughs> it's not about the corn palace today. It's one thing to lack fruit out of season, like this fig tree, right? This fig tree was out of season, so I'm not going to blame this fig tree. Jesus used it as an object lesson. But it's another thing to lack fruit while pretending you have it. And I'm afraid that most of us are guilty of that. I'm afraid that most Christians are guilty of that. I'm afraid that most churches are guilty of that. And that grieves my heart today. Be real and bear fruit. And you know, bearing fruit, we, we don't do it to earn God's affection, but rather to fulfill what God created us to do. Believe. A faithful prayer. Forgive. So once again this week, the, the challenge from Jesus to the disciples applies to us in two ways. Check our hearts individually. Are we bearing fruit? Are we pretending to bear fruit and just full of leaves? Or is there really fruit there? Check our hearts. And check the heart of the church. So Jesus, in this parable, completely flips the story back on to Peter and the disciples who are astonished when they see the withered fig tree. And he tells them, believe, pray faithfully, and forgive. As I wrap up my thoughts this morning, I'm going to share a quote with you from Greg Lanier. He's a pastor at River Oaks Church and a professor at Reformed Theological Seminary in Orlando, Florida. He writes for the Gospel Coalition Network, and in summing up this story of Jesus cursing the fig tree, this is what he says. Our personal lives can look like they are in leaf. Our leaves may look like those of a supermom, a winner, a perfect family, an A-team Christian with an overstuffed schedule of ministry activities. But the root may be withered. There may be no fruit of holiness and no intimacy with God. What's worse, our leaves may even fool us or others. And our churches can do the same. A church's leaves may look impressive. Booming attendance, capital campaigns, clever pastors, impressive music. But what will the Lord find upon close inspection? Will he find only leaves or will he find figs? Two. As I read these scriptures and I dig into them and I, as I study the life of Jesus Christ and his teaching, boy, am I challenged today to look at my heart and to look at our church and to consider are we all leaves and no fruit or are we bearing fruit? I want you to take some time this morning to reflect and to examine yourself, your heart, our church, the church. Are we really bearing fruit? Or do we just pretend and make it look good on the outside? Let's pray. God, I pray right now that you would convict our hearts. God, that you would take this lesson from Jesus 
and show us your truth and the reality of our life and our heart and our church. God, I pray that each one of us would examine where we are at in life, where we are at with you, Lord, in our faith and our walk with you, and look at our tree and, and see if we just have leaves or if there really is fruit there. And God, we could spend so much more time teaching and learning from your word and from the scriptures of fruit and how we can bear fruit, God. But today, I pray that our hearts would turn back to you. That today, we would seek to, to you and ask you, God, to give us clean hearts, clean hands. Purify us today, God as we consider our sin, as we consider forgiveness, as we consider prayer and your word and faith and belief in you. And Lord, as we take time to do that, God, I pray that you would show us the cross. The cross of Jesus Christ, his broken body and his blood shed for us. That we might be reconciled to you, Father. I pray you would wake us up, Lord, and that we would begin to bear fruit in the name of Jesus Christ. Challenge our hearts today, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning we are going to partake in communion. The worship team right now is going to lead us in a song, and I want to encourage you to examine yourself, examine your heart. And while they sing, you may be led to sing with them, or maybe you'll just be led to pray, to bow, to examine yourself, to reflect and consider your heart this morning. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty eight says, Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. So after a few moments, after they lead us in this song, I'll come back up and lead us in a time of communion, remembering what Jesus did with his broken body and his blood shed for us.